It is our first Sunday in December, and I love December. It's such a happy month. Brian and I actually had the chance recently to go to our first ever Christmas tree farm because you have these here, and it was this magical experience. Thanks for the recommendation, Lynn Holland. And I just love how our world literally lights up around us and whether people are consciously thinking this or not, celebrating the life of Jesus, celebrating Jesus coming in to this earth. And so today is our first Sunday of December, but it's our second Sunday of Advent. And last Sunday in Advent, we focused on hope. And today we focus on peace. And today as we worship and as we listen to Sean's sermon, My prayer is that we can really allow our hearts to anxiously, excitingly welcome in the true Prince of Peace. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the unit deity, pleased as man with to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, rest with healing in his wings. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Come, desire of nations, come, fix in us thy humble. Each Sunday afternoon, the elders pray for people in the congregation. We usually get about 25 to 35 prayer requests that come from the prayer cards that you submit online, from conversations that we've had with people, or from things that we just hear about what's going on. Sometimes people join us during these sessions, but each week we pray for people, and sometimes those prayers carry over from week to week. While we lift up your prayer requests, we also thank God for all the blessings that he's given us and for the blessings of this church. We celebrate when God intervenes and we see his hand working in sometimes supernatural ways, and it goes far beyond just coincidence. When we see this all working, we realize that God answers our prayers. Prayers are very powerful, and we just delight in seeing how God can work in this world. The elders encourage all of you to have an active prayer life. And we also encourage you to fill out the online prayer request forms and to really allow us to pray for you during these Sunday afternoon events. Would you all take a moment to pray with me at this time? Lord, thank you 
for removing the veil that separated us from you and allowing us to pray directly to you, to petition you with our heartfelt needs and to pray for others. Be with our congregation and with our families and communities at this time as we struggle with life, with the extra burdens that are upon us all at this time and with the heightened concern that we have for others. Thank you, Lord, for providing your rest during these times with providing a way for us to be content in all circumstances and for providing us with peace, joy, hope, and the fruit of the Spirit. It is in the name and the power of your Son, Jesus, that we lift up this prayer. Amen. Hi, church. Today I will be reading to you from the Word of the Lord in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 56, Mary's song. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercies extend to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Christ was born. 
Good morning. When I think of communion, I think of the Passover and uh, what happened in those days. There were 10 plagues that were uh, fraught upon the Egyptians uh, as the Israelites tried to get their freedom. The 10th plague and the worst one was the death of all the infants. And um, so in order to avoid that, the Israelites slaughtered a lamb and they painted the door frames with blood from the lamb. And during the night, the death angel passed over and they were saved. And so every year, the, Israel, the Jewish people celebrate uh, the Passover. And so it was the time of the Passover when Jesus was entering the city, Jerusalem. And he came, as he came, he was riding on a donkey, and all the people were praising God and celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the city was sort of in a turmoil because people did not know what was going to happen. Anyway, the Jewish leaders got together, and they were concerned about this radical Jesus, and so they decided they were going to kill him. Well, just about that time, Jesus invited his 12 disciples to join him in the upper room. And when they did, uh, they did not know that Jesus was, uh, this would be the last supper he would have with his disciples, and that they, and that he would be leaving them very soon uh, to a horrible death on the cross. So if we read in Matthew, Chapter 26, the following. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. So let's take a moment and pray for the bread. Father God, we want to thank you for this bread, which represents Jesus' body, and also the body of Christ, which we are all a part. As we take it, may we remember the sacrifice was made for each of us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Join me as we pray for the fruit of the vine. Lord, we want to thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, your blood shed for our sins. May we always be thankful for this sacrifice which brought forgiveness to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Each year at the beginning of our annual holiday season, we celebrate Thanksgiving. And many of us, Spend time with family, friends around tables filled with yummy foods, and we look each other in the eye and use words like love and devotion. And we thank God for the relationships we share, and the prosperity we are blessed with. But how often do we stop and consider what we are truly thankful for? Each week at this time in our worship assembly, someone comes on here and reads inspiring scripture and helps us refocus our attention on our offering. This week, we want to ask you, ask you to think specifically about what you are thankful for. You may be thankful for your job or career. You may be thankful for your health or your friends. 
You may be thankful for where you live or the school you go to. There are as many things to be thankful for as there are members of our congregation. Each one of us is different and has different things to be thankful for. At this time, let us consider our blessings and what we are thankful for. Father God, we are grateful for all that you shower down upon us. At this time, each of us has different things we are considering in our hearts. We offer to you our heart-filled thanks. In Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we could come before you with confidence, knowing, Father, that because you came at just the right time, Father, we could have confidence in knowing that we are indeed saved. And Father, that's what we celebrate this season. We're reminded of your son, Jesus, who came as a little babe, father in a manger. Miraculous birth, God, came that we might be saved at just the right time, the Bible says. And so, Father, we sing and we celebrate. And as we do that this morning, we pray that Holy Spirit would inhabit not only this auditorium, but every living room, family room, where your people are watching and praising this morning. And above all, God, may you be glorified, may you be magnified, may you be praised and lifted high in our worship. So God, as we celebrate this season, we, God, sing that we want you to be the center, the center of our lives. Church, let's sing. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From my heart to the head. 
In every family, there are favorite stories, stories that no matter how many times they've been told before, we never tire of hearing them. These are the stories that make us laugh, feel warm, bond us, and remind us of our history that we've shared together. I imagine over the Thanksgiving holidays, many of you listened to stories that you had heard no fewer than a hundred times before, but you listened like you were hearing it for the very first time. And then you laughed like you had no idea where the story was headed. And in the end, you felt closer to the people around you because of the telling of that story. I know that's certainly true in my family. There are stories that we love to tell and retell and retell again, and it is absolutely great. And in many ways, that's what I hope takes place among this family, our church family, over the next few weeks. We are going to revisit a story. Now, I really hope that for some of you who are tuning in, you're hearing this story for the very first time because there is nothing like the first hearing of this story. And if that describes you, then I have to warn you that much of what you're going to hear is going to sound absolutely ridiculous. In many ways, it's going to sound closer to Harry Potter fiction than actual history, but this is the account of a very real event. You might be skeptical, but I would ask you to remain open to the possibility that this story might be true, and then consider what it means for your life if it is. Now, for most of us, we've heard this story for as many Christmases that we've been alive. Now, yes, some of us grew up in churches where this story was told in June rather than December, but the point is we have heard this story many, many times. And for this reason, I doubt that anything I say over the next few, four weeks will be new to you. But I still believe there's value in us joining together, even if it's online, to listen to one of the most amazing, world-changing stories that has ever been told. And here's what I hope. I hope 
that in the end, the telling of this story will bond us closer together, challenge us to, challenge us to be more devoted to Jesus Christ, and most importantly, be more in awe of and in love with the one who is behind this story. For the next few weeks, we're going to bounce around different towns and villages throughout the ancient Middle East. For this reason, I've entitled this sermon series Christmas Villages because it unfolds in several different villages. The place our story begins is Hebron. At least this is the place that most biblical scholars believe that the gospel writer is referring to when he speaks these words in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Hebron, the city of the priest, as it was often referred to, was the place that this young teen, probably no more than 14 years old by the name of Mary, fled to after receiving some news. Not just any news, but drop you to your knees kind of news. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's that news that comes so far out of left field that you're not sure how to process it when you originally hear it. Now, sometimes it's good news. You get word that you've been accepted into your dream Ivy League university, even though you applied as a fluke. Sometimes it's bad news. You find out that you're the person who's going to be let go, even though you're the leading salesperson in the whole company. And sometimes... The news is so surprising, so outrageous, you're not exactly sure what category to put it in when you first hear it. I imagine this was the case for Mary. Now listen to the news that she received. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Being highly favored sounds like pretty fantastic news, but being told that you're going to be pregnant at the age of 14, well, that definitely goes into the terrifying news category. But more than that, the news that Mary received, it was extremely confusing. And confusing because she had never been with a man. Now, yes, she had a fiancé, but they had not been together as a couple has to be together to produce this type of result. You see, these two kids were God-fearing Jewish kids who, understand, uh, who understood the consequences spelled out in the law of Moses for fornication. They had been and would continue to be pure until their wedding night. Now, for those of, who would wonder, and there certainly would be, would Mary step out on her blood fiancé? The answer was a resounding no. And yet here was this angel informing her that she was going to be with child. <laughs> this boggled Mary's mind. Continuing in Luke chapter 1, and verse 34, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Well, Mary is not the last one to find this news hard to believe. Some 2,000 years later, there are people, people who believe in God, who find the virgin birth so hard to believe that they're quick to suggest that what you believe about this really is inconsequential. Now, there are a lot of different responses one could give as to why the virgin birth matters, but I would simply offer you this. If you cannot trust that Jesus came into the world as stated in Scripture, then how can you trust that he exited the world in a resurrected body as stated in Scripture? That's a pretty big deal. But what I believe or you believe or anyone else believes about the virgin birth, it doesn't matter nearly as much as the fact that Mary decided to accept what she had been told. We continue the story in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 and 38. 
The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary accepted it, but did she believe it? I believe that she did, but she still had her fair share of doubts. And just in case nobody has ever said this to you before, let me mention it. Faith and doubt can coexist. And in the midst of our doubts, we often need someone or something to confirm the truth. And that is why Mary set out for the hill country. Now, how would going to Hebron help her with the doubts that she had about the news that she had been given? Well, in the midst of sharing with Mary this news of her upcoming pregnancy, the angel Gabriel mentioned that an amazing work of God had already taken place in the village of Hebron. And this amazing work of God, it involved her cousin Elizabeth. Her her cousin, who was quite a bit older, she had lived her entire life in the worst possible condition for a Jewish woman. She had been barren her entire life. Now, had been is the operative term. Listen to the news that Gabriel shared with this God-fearing but very confused teen girl. Luke chapter 1, verse 36 through 37. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, and they said it because it was true. But she's now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary went to Hebron for one reason. She needed tangible proof that what the angel spoke was truth, that nothing is impossible for God. And God, in his infinite wisdom, knew it would be helpful for Mary to see that an amazing work was taking place in another place, that God was doing the impossible somewhere else as well. You know, the word in the original language seems to indicate that as soon as Mary walked into the home of her cousin Elizabeth, she she yelled out, It's kind of like what many of us do when a relative from out of town comes into our home after not seeing them for a long period of time. We have that type of greeting in which we say, oh, I'm so glad that you're here. I I can't believe it. I've missed you so much. Come here and let me give you a hug. Now, I don't know for sure if Mary said any of those things or not, but whatever it was that she said, it got quite the reaction. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 41 through 45 When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. It was at Hebron that Mary learned the truth, that that if God could bring life from a barren woman, then he could surely bring life from a virgin. That's one of the reasons that we revisit this favorite family story every single year, is to be reminded of this great truth, that nothing is impossible for God. You see, by this point in the year, many people have been beaten down And I imagine that describes all of us in 2020. And there are some of you who have lost your job this year. And others of you, you've had to put your dreams on hold for a season. Some of you have watched your kids struggle mightily. Others of you who have lost, you've lost a love. And others of you have put a loved one to rest. By this point in the year, there are many of us who are questioning if life will ever be normal, let alone good again. I want to encourage you this week to spend some time in Hebron. Spend some time with this woman who was far too old to be pregnant by the name of Elizabeth. And spend some time with this morally pure but soon to be pregnant teen girl by the name of Mary. You see, if you spend some time in Hebron, what you're reminded of is this great truth that God, because nothing is impossible for him, he can bring new life into your life in 2021. Is that a promise that he will? Absolutely not. In fact, sometimes God allows us to spend time in the wilderness far longer than we desire. But when he deems the time is right, 
God often does what we have already decided was absolutely impossible for him to do. It's one of the reasons that I love this job. Over 29 years of ministry, I've had a a front row seat to see God do the impossible in the lives of people. I've watched people who have been told that you'll never have a child bring a child into their home. I've watched people who have lost a great love discover a new love. I've seen people who lost a high-paying job find a career path that tapped into their passion. I've watched individuals who have struggled with addiction overcome that addiction through the power of God and gone on to use that to minister to other people. I've watched children who have walked away from God come back home to God. You see, in this job, like any other job, there are things that I get tired of. But one thing I will never tire of is seeing God do the impossible in the lives of people. And he does it all the time if we'll just pay attention. In fact, one of the things that I would encourage you to do this week is to spend some time sharing some stories with your family of times that you've seen God do the impossible in your life. I don't care if you've told those stories a hundred times before, take time to tell those stories again because they inspire us to be reminded that nothing is impossible for God. When Mary went to Hebron and learned or was reminded of that truth, she was also reminded of another truth. And what is that? Well, she was reminded that what the angel said about her in verse 28 is true. What did he say? Let's go back and listen to his words. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. What does it mean to be highly favored? It means to be blessed. It means to receive a benefit. It carries the idea of receiving unfair preferential treatment. Why she had been highly favored by God, that was probably a mystery to this 14-year-old girl, but she believed that it was true. And knowing that she had been highly favored by God, well, it brought forth a song. A song ripe with overtones of revolution, but a song born from the joy of knowing this truth. She was highly favored by God. Let's just listen to the opening lines of Mary's song. Verse 46 through 48. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Can you imagine what it would be like to be favored by God like that? I hope so. Because you are. You see, the only other place in the New Testament where the word that is used that is translated highly favored is used is in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6 to describe Christ followers. In the same way that Mary was highly favored by God, we have been highly favored or made acceptable by Christ. Listen to the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Mary was highly favored to bring Christ into the world And we have been made part of the family of God because we are highly favored. And now, because we are highly favored, God entrusts us to bring Christ into the world as well. Which leads me to another truth that I hope you'll notice and that Mary was reminded of at Hebron. And that is simply this, is that God was working his truth in more than one place at one time. He was working the life of Elizabeth while she was in Hebron. At the same time, he was working the life of Mary while she was in Nazareth. The big point is this, is that God was working in both of these women in both of these places for the good of humankind. And he's working in your life as well. It doesn't matter if you live in a single family home right here in Campbell, or if you live in a townhouse in Sunnyvale, or if you're sleeping on a friend's couch in an apartment in East San Jose. He's working the life of every single person all of the time. Why? For the good of humanity. He's working in our lives. 
to confirm this truth, that Christ was born a virgin into this world to reconcile all of humanity back to God. So be obedient right where you are. Be Christ in your neighborhood. Be Christ in your workplace. Be Christ at your school, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Be Christ in your home. Make Christ known. Now, my hope as we've spent just a few moments in Hebron this morning is this, is that this time that we've spent together has done for you what it did for Mary. When she left Hebron, her strength, or her faith was strengthened. She had a, a renewed spirit about her that she was willing to endure all the skepticism, all the criticism that she would surely face. And more than that, she had a pledge on her heart. It's a pledge that I hope that you'll join me in making this morning. So wherever you are right now, I want to invite you to stand and read these words with me from Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. You see, God still does the impossible in and through those who have enough faith to face their doubts. So this week, let's seek the truth. Let's live the truth. And let's serve the God who so favored us that he came into this world. Thank you so much for joining us online this morning. We appreciate you spending time worshiping our great God with us today. If there's anything that we can do to serve you or be praying about for you, we would invite you to please submit that online at this time. Or later this week, email those prayer requests to us and know that we'll be praying for you. May God bless you with a wonderful week. Children weep no more, hope is on the horizon, weary world we hold, your promised Messiah, angels let your song the dawn of salvation.
darkness reigns no more for Jesus is greater he is greater angels let your song begin here comes heaven all creation Thank you, Sean and the praise team and so many others that made this service possible today. We're so grateful to be a part of a church family that has so many that are willing to use their skills and talents to glorify God in the kingdom. In this season of hustle and bustle and merriness and bright and Black Friday and Cyber Monday, there's so much to do to consume for ourselves. But this week, I really want to be intentional, and I want to challenge myself and all of you to not only receive this Prince of Peace in our hearts, but take that peace and pass it along to others. Sure, with our resources, but with our not just with our money, but with our time. Maybe that's a small encounter at a grocery store, or a conversation around your kitchen table, or maybe it's stopping your car and talking to someone on the street and saying their name and being intentional to pass peace. So in this season, as we await the Prince of Peace, may we be intentional to pass peace along to others. Campbell family, go in peace.